Hello, Pastor John. Reading through the story of the crucifixion this week, something caught my attention that I'd read over many times. In Luke twenty three twenty six, in the midst of the crucifixion event, we read this. And as they led Jesus away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. I know that God is sovereign, and therefore this was not an accident or a random detail added into the story. What's the significance of Simon carrying Jesus' cross? What does God want us to see here? This is really good for me to think about, because I've read that a hundred times and have not paused, like so many of these questions force me to do, and that's really valuable. Sometimes when authors are reporting facts, like this is a fact, Mm -hmm. sometimes when they report facts in their narrative, they give us clear clues and pointers why they are including those facts and what they want us to learn from them. I don't see really clear, decisive clues here or in any of the Gospels for why the gospel writers include this fact. One of the reasons for that may be that Simon, who carried the cross, may have become a well-known presence in the early church so that the mere reference to his name functions as just another historical evidence. This man right mm-hmm. there that you know, yeah. he carried had carried the cross. And the reason I say that is because in Mark 1521, Simon is called the father of Alexander and Rufus. Like, that's an unusual piece of information. I mean, and it would be very odd for Mark to put that in unless he expected his readers to know who Alexander <laughs> and Rufus was. Yeah. And Mark is sometimes associated with Peter as a gospel writer and Peter uh, is associated with Rome, and in Romans 16, there's a man named Rufus. <laughs> so <laughs> there are little things like that yeah. that cause people to say, okay, th- this is this is an allusion to a man that everybody in the church knew. He had become something of a, of a known person, and so it, you didn't have to say anything about him. You said, he's the one who carried the cross. Isn't that amazing? You can go talk to him and ask him what it was like. Yeah. But I suspect that in Luke's mind, there was more going on than merely a historical link between the crucifixion uh, and a person who was known as the father uh, of Alexander and, and Rufus. So let me make some suggestions, and that's really all they are, and I'm, I'm willing to make them as suggestions rather than pronouncements of, of certainties that I see, because it may be that those who listen to me could see more than I see and make one of these suggestions move towards, oh, that really was intended by by Luke. So I'm giving you homework to do, kind of. <laughs> so number one, number one suggestion. Simon is described as from Cyrene. Um, that's a city in North Africa, today's Libya. We don't know if he was Jewish or Gentile because the name Simon was common for Greeks and Jews. We don't know if he was visiting Jerusalem or lived there, but what we know is that the Gospels draw attention to this man's got a foreign origin. He's an African. So Luke might say, let it be noted that a foreigner served Jesus in his final hour, indeed an African. Hmm. There's suggestion number one. Number two, Luke is the only one of the Gospels that says Simon carried the cross behind Jesus. All the other Gospels that mention this say he just carried it. Does Luke want us to remember Luke 9.23, where he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, is Luke suggesting to us this is a picture of what discipleship is. Number three, if we think that Luke was pointing to this event as a parable of discipleship, like I just suggested, could the fact that Joseph was chosen so suddenly and unexpectedly for the heavy task 
uh, be Luke's way of teaching us that we don't always choose hmm. the moment of our cross bearing. Yeah. We don't always choose the moment of our suffering. They come upon us in unexpected ways, frightening ways, heavy ways, painful ways, seemingly random ways. In other words, the fact that Simon was chosen seemingly randomly. I mean, it just says he was coming in from the field. He was coming in from the country. That that little added note seems to say, this is random, mm-hmm. you think. <laughs> a, a lesson that every moment of our lives, coming in from the country, we should be ready to be, be snatched into the service of Jesus in a painful way, and we just don't know when. Maybe. Number four, suggestion. I think most people would assume that demanding someone else to carry Jesus' cross means he was at the breaking point, too weak to finish the trek on his own. But what we may not think about as quickly is whether this act by the authorities, maybe the soldiers, this decision to get Simon to help, was an act of compassion or cruelty. Or simple expediency. Here's what I mean. If he couldn't carry his cross, somebody had to because these soldiers are charged, crucify him. Hmm. And if they let him die on the way, somebody's going to be ticked, right? So maybe just pure expediency. Got to get this man up there to get him crucified. Hmm. Or it might have been a moment of compassion from one of the Roman soldiers Or, this is one I had not realized, Matthew Henry suggests it may be that they saw Jesus was about to die under the burden, and they were so bloodthirsty or fearful of punishment from Pilate that they wanted to make sure he survived for the remaining torture. Hmm. (laughs) In other words, just the opposite of compassion. We've got to get nails through his hands Hmm. and nails through his feet feet. We can't let this man just die here of exhaustion under his his cross. Number five, fifth suggestion, one more. Only Luke tells us that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is in agony and was helped by an angel as he prayed. Um, in Luke twenty two forty three, an angel came and helped him, sustained him, gave him strength. In Hebrews five seven, it says Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to Him who is able to save him from death, and he was heard. He was heard because of his reverence, his godly fear. Now, how does that work? He prayed that God would save him from death, and he was heard. Hmm. Well, he died. So I've argued in an article at Desiring God that Jesus was saved from death in answer to his cry, not in the sense that he didn't die, but in the sense that he was saved from the faith-destroying powers of death. Hmm. In other words, death loomed in front of him, and he was a human being, and death was so horrible that it could have deterred him from obedience. And he pleaded with his father, don't let death destroy me like that. And an angel came and helped him. So um, what he was praying was not that he wouldn't die, but that the horrors of suffering and death wouldn't deter him from his obedience and his saving mission, could it be then that Simon's stepping in to help Jesus make it to the cross, help Jesus just at that moment, was like the angel showing up at the perfect moment just when the humanly weak Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and now on the road to the cross needed help to finish his mission. So, whichever of these five, six suggestions, whatever are part of Luke's intention as he writes, what we know is this. Number one, Simon was a real historical person, and he was there at a real historical moment. Number two, he was a foreigner. 
an African who served Jesus in his final hour. Three, carrying the cross behind Jesus is a beautiful and painful picture of our calling as disciples, according to Luke 9. Whether Luke intended us to see that or not, it's true. Four, the call to suffer for Jesus is often sudden and costly and seemingly random. Five, Simon's help proved to be both a relief temporarily, but also added suffering because it sustained Jesus to get to the cross and have the horrible experience of crucifixion for us. And six, we know that Jesus cried out to his heavenly Father in Gethsemane that he be given help. He needed help so that his obedience would not falter, and God answered his prayers. These these were the hardest hours of Jesus' life. And as we meditate on all these details, oh, what love, what thankfulness should rise in our hearts.